Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm Linda Jacobson, Vice President of U.S. Programs with the Population Reference Bureau. Thanks for joining us for this webinar on migration and the environment. Today's webinar is funded by the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. The panelists will answer questions at the end of their presentations. And now I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers. Jason Bremner is Associate Vice President in International Programs here at the Population Reference Bureau. And Lori Hunter is Professor of Sociology at the University of Colorado Boulder. They will be discussing the relationship between migration and the environment and highlighting innovative research taking place at population research centers across the United States. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Jason. Thank you, Linda. First, I'd like to thank my colleagues here at PRB for supporting this webinar today and providing countless hours of support in the writing of the Population Bulletin on Migration and the Environment that Lori Hunter and I are going to talk about today. I'd also like to take a quick moment to acknowledge the passing of our recent colleague and friend, Dr. Charles Teller, who was very passionate about population environment research and particularly these migration environment uh, relationships. Finally, I would like to thank all of you who are listening and watching today, and Lori and I look forward to your questions later. So why are we focused on migration and the environment today? Well, throughout human history, people have been on the move, exploring new places, pursuing work opportunities, fleeing conflict, uh, or migrating due to changing political, social, or environmental conditions. So migration is not a, a new phenomenon and certainly not new to, to demographic researchers. Uh, today, there are an estimated 230 million international migrants, and by 2050, that number is projected to nearly double to well over 400 million international migrants. In addition, though the sources of data are not fantastic, it's well accepted among demographers that there are probably two to three times as many internal migrants or people who have moved uh, within their own country uh, from their place of birth or place of origin to some other place in the country. So there are a lot of migrants in the world, and there's a lot of migration continually happening. At the same time, uh, climate change is clearly impacting our world. Now, the reasons for moving are complex, but over the past decade, as this evidence of global climate change has accumulated, academics, policymakers, and the media have given more attention to migration uh, as a possible response to climate change. What climate impacts am I talking about or are we hearing about? Well, the recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, report from 2014, or their fifth assessment report, actually documents some, uh, clearly some of the impacts that are already occurring. Uh, things such as uh, freshwater resources becoming scarcer in many areas, negative impacts on crop yields, particularly wheat and maize, uh, evidence of people's vulnerability to climate extremes, seeing what happens uh, to, to households, to people, due to heat waves, droughts, floods, and cyclones. And we're seeing that climate hazards are exacerbating other stressors on livelihoods, um, especially for those living in poverty. So putting together this world of movement in which people are, are constantly migrating and the impacts of climate change, people are thinking about what the future of migration. We can look at, uh, at this graphic to see the major concern that people have about whether climate change will displace large numbers of vulnerable people around the world. Looking at this graphic, for example, you can see that uh, because of rising sea levels, the population exposed to flooding during extreme storms is expected to grow dramatically over the coming decades. And you can see here 
the current population exposed in red on this graphic in different uh, regions of the world under a, some assumptions of sea level rise of different levels. And you can see then the growth uh, in the population exposed to, uh, to flooding events or a 100-year storm event in those yellow and blue bars that are above that red line. So we do see large numbers of people in the future exposed to uh, this, in this case, flooding. So the impacts of climate change will vary widely across the globe. This is just one example. Uh, some regions will experience drought and increased temperatures, while others will experience more extreme weather, such as hurricanes. Uh, and people in rural areas where households rely uh, daily on their local environment will feel these effects most intensely. Based on this, people have been asking a, a pretty simple question, which is how will the changing environment contribute to migration? Well, seemingly simple, um, but perhaps more complex, as, when, as uh, Lori and I will talk about today. This is not a new question. In fact, uh, a widely cited article uh, estimated that more than 25 million people were displaced by environmental factors in 1995 and claimed that as, a, uh, as global warming or climate change takes hold, more than 200 million people could be affected by future climate change. So they were asking this question and, and came up with a number or an answer. And unfortunately, that number really is called into question by most researchers and even the authors themselves who now discount these uh, rough estimates uh, as really not being based on an understanding of migration environment relationships and that those were really very rough uh, back of the envelope calculations. So this has really led migration researchers to look more closely at how the changing environment contributes to migration. And and re-ask this question, will climate change displace large numbers of people? And to answer that, uh, researchers really have asked, what can we learn from studying current migration environment dynamics that will allow us to look forward and, and, and estimate future impacts? And this is the collection, of, a lot of the collection of research and studies that we'll highlight today. And then ask the question, can we generalize from from this current research to estimate future movements and the uh, policy implications. So based on uh, these questions and the emerging research, uh, this population bulletin really explores the, uh, in more depth the relationship between migration and the environment and highlights innovative research from the population centers funded by uh, the Eunice Kennedy Shriver uh, National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. So this research uh, that we're looking at uh, focuses specifically on the new, new um, research coming out of population centers. And a lot of the population environment research coming out uh, these days is focused on migration environment connections. And we've tried to highlight in this bulletin the exciting and innovative new approaches to linking in so, uh, social and environmental data that are enabling research, researchers to more explicitly link people to the environment on which they depend. And I will share uh, with you just, oh, just quickly a few of the main messages uh, that, that we highlight in this population bulletin. And I also encourage all of you to, to uh, to spend more time looking through this publication available on our website. But one of the main messages is that this research uh, suggests that the popular narrative that many of you may, may have heard about uh, in media and in other for, uh, formats or forums is uh, this narrative of environmental refugees is oversimplified and largely inaccurate. And it suggests that more research is needed to understand these relationships. So I'm going to summarize these main messages. And then my co-author, co Lori Hunter, will go into more detail uh, discussing specific research studies. Improved methods for linking environmental and social data have allowed researchers, 
uh, as, as evidence in these studies, to much more carefully link environmental change to migration. And it is clear that there are several cases in, that indicate that migration is sometimes uh, a dramatic response to dramatic environmental pushes. Consider Hurricane Katrina, which is shown here, a, a, a satellite image of Hurricane Katrina shown here. The Hurricane Katrina devastated the U.S. Gulf Coast in August of 2005. And at that time, over one million adults uh, evacuated their homes. That's about 85% of the residents. Uh, and really, only by uh, several days after the storm, only non-emergency personnel remained. Katrina was estimated to have caused nearly $100 billion in, in property damage. And for many people, it was weeks to months before neighborhoods were safe enough for residents to return. And in fact, in, uh, in this case, many residents didn't return, or those that did return are different from those who originally lived there. And, and we talk a bit about this more in the bulletin. But what's clear here is that, yes, there are these dramatic push events. And these are the ones that we often hear about in the media because they come along with large amounts of damage, big movements of people. The research, however, suggests that more often than not, that most migration in uh, environment research really indicates that there's a continuum of pressure that environmental factors can exert on livelihoods and on uh, households and people. And that the dramatic push uh, or forced displacement, as you might see in the right side of this, uh, of this graphic, is really just one side of this environmental pressure in a continuum uh, that includes medium-term pressures, uh, such as severe drought, which doesn't act at one brief moment in time, but can uh, act over several seasons uh, or can over several years, uh, as well as a chronic long-term strain in which you have uh, a lower level of pressure, but in which there are soil there's soil degradation, declining land availability, or consistently poor agricultural prices. And so we have, see this this continuum of environmental pressure that doesn't just reflect the forced displacement or large uh, displacement of people at one point of time. So natural disaster uh, displacement is really just at one extreme end, uh, representing those acute events. And more chronic, longer-term strains um, emerge uh, over time and also result in migratory responses. And in fact, based on this, what we see is that unlike the popular narrative of environmental refugees um, that really indicates people crossing international borders, the more common migration response is actually one in which environmental migrants move voluntarily and move short distances, move within their country, move to neighboring towns, move uh, to neighboring regions. Furthermore, many environmental migrants will return after temporary moves. So they'll return to their place of origin or maintain very strong connections with their places of origin. So they aren't displaced long distances, and they often remain, or remain in the area or will return soon after uh, the pressure subsides. Furthermore, not everybody moves, and this research uh, suggests that environmental change may constrain some migrants. Some uh, environmental pressures really make those most vulnerable households uh, unable to move, and that may be because they don't have the resources uh, and or their economic conditions are changing such that they're no longer able to make a move and they may be stuck in place. So in some cases, the vulnerable are the most likely to move, and in other cases, the vulnerable are unable to move. I think most important is 
what is clear from all of this research is that environmental change almost always interacts with other drivers of migration. And one can rarely isolate environmental change as the sole factor inducing a person or household to migrate. And my colleague, uh, Lori Hunter, is really going to elaborate on, on this point and on the ones that I mentioned above uh, in more detail by going through some of the very specific research highlights that we touch on in the Population Bulletin. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Lori Hunter. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. And I would like to also extend a warm welcome to all of you listening to uh, the Migration and Environment webinar. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to share the research on this topic with you. So I'm taking the baton from Jason as we think about the complexity of the migration decision and kind of debunk those earlier images of uh, you know, simplistic mass movements of climate refugees. And the research around migration and environment has become increase increasingly sophisticated over the past couple of decades, in large part by drawing innovatively on different data sources and innovatively on existing migration theory. So we know a lot about why people do and don't move, and there are uh, factors at the micro level, at the meso level, um, and at the macro level that shape migration decision making and the probability of any individual or household moving. So when we think about who's going to migrate or who's going to stay, there are micro characteristics like personal and household factors related to age, sex, education, wealth, marital status, ethnicity and religion, for example, that shaped the probability of an individual moving. And of course, those characteristics combine to further shape characteristics. Men or women in different age categories have different probabilities of migration. We also have understanding of the meso level factors that shape migration. We can think of those as the intervening obstacles and contextual factors that might facilitate or constrain movement. Things like the political or legal framework in which households and individuals are working, cost of moving, social networks, or the lack of social networks to tap into, activities of different recruitment agencies, and so on. So these are things outside of the individual or household that are also shaping the decision making and ultimately the probability of movement. And now we can move up another scale to the macro level and think about the way that environmental factors like exposures to hazards, ecosystem services. So I do my research predominantly in rural South Africa where households uh, make heavy use of local communal natural resources. So those are ecosystem services provided to the households. And as those decline, households may be more likely to move. So environmental factors at the macro scale influencing the probability as well. There's also economic factors, obviously employment opportunities, income and wages, cost of living, social factors. Individuals move to seek education. Individuals move or don't move because they have family obligations. So again, these, these factors are operating outside of the household, but interacting with the micro and the meso characteristics to shape the probability of movement. Political factors, discrimination, persecution, and different kinds of conflicts, and imagine policy incentives. Um, so all of these can interact as well to shape migration. And finally, demographic factors, population size and density, people moving to urban centers because of bright light, big city opportunities, perhaps people leaving big urban centers because they want the quiet of a more rural life. So again, these act. Um, at particular times in people's life cycles to shape migration, so they're interacting with age, sex, and uh, socioeconomic status. So it's way more complex than simply thinking the environment pushing migrants to new places of being. And then, of course, climate change, as Jason mentioned, you know, acting on top of these macro-level influences to reshape the way that they're impacting migration. Imagine, for example, climate change impacting available employment opportunities um, as different kinds of possibilities are no longer available because of shifting environments. So maybe the viability of agricultural livelihoods perhaps changing because of climate change. 
personal environment, acting on employment opportunities, which then ultimately shape the likelihood of migration. So the idea here really using existing migration theory to think about all of the different factors at all of the different scales that come together to shape migration. So for scientists to really methodologically grapple with that complexity requires innovation. There's a lot of stuff going on there at lots of different scales. And demographic data has not always included geographic information. So we may have lots of social data we can tap into to study social processes like you know, determinants of poverty or determinants of fertility. But most of the time, those data sets don't also let us know where somebody lives or where somebody works. If we don't have that geographic information, how can we link those people and the decisions they're making to natural disasters, to rainfall, to temperature, to changes in rainfall and temperature, to local natural resources, to changes in resources? If we can't put people into place, we can't study those population and environment connections. So I recently had an article published with two collaborators, Elizabeth Fussell, who is from Brown University, and Clark Gray, who's at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. It's called Measuring the Environmental Dimensions of Human Migration, the Demographer's Toolkit. This came out in Global Environmental Change just within the last month. So Jason and I weren't even able to incorporate it into the population bulletin. But we thought that some of the examples might be of use here in illustrating the kinds of studies that people have um, been engaging in that really revealed those clusters of findings that Jason presented a couple of slides ago. So these are just some examples. And they're examples of the way that demographers have innovated to look at this connection between migration and environment. So one example, migration and rainfall in Burkina Faso. Um, this study was done in a very impoverished region where there's heavy levels of dependence on rain-fed agriculture. And the researchers, it was Sabine Onri and her colleagues, merged survey data um, with community-level data and rainfall information. So they had a nationally representative retrospective survey that collected individual life histories of migration and employment for almost 9,000 individuals. Um, and then they also collected community level data from 600 communities and merged those together with rainfall information from 1960 to 1998 and then thought about recent rainfall in the last three years as related to whether or not households migrated. They looked at the ethnicity of household. They looked, they looked at different kinds of livelihood strategies. And they found in their statistical models that short distance moves between rural communities were very common in times of stress. So suggesting that migration was a strategy of livelihood diversification during periods of rainfall shortage. So it's a very clever way of using existing data to examine the migration environment connection. Another example from Hurricane Katrina, which Jason already briefly mentioned, um, but very hard to study disaster migration because people have scattered and they're really hard to find. So this example is um, of studying disaster-induced displacement. August 2005, a mandatory evacuation along the US Gulf Coast, as Jason mentioned, um, there was low levels of return. By 2012, New Orleans as a city still had only two-thirds of the pre-storm population, and those people weren't necessarily all migrants. There were new folks that hadn't lived in New Orleans before. So Narayan Sastri and Elizabeth Fussell did an amazing study um, called the Displaced New Orleans Residence Pilot Study, where they tried to track migrants as feasible. And this is one of the very few demographic studies to date that really focused on displacement and return migration following a natural disaster. So the sampling strategy involved identifying a complete roster of addresses from before the hurricanes happened, and then sampling dwellings stratified by the level of flooding. And then in 2006, with a variety of techniques, they went looking for migrants of the dwellings. 
they had trouble finding them and they found about two-thirds of the households, only about 80% of that two-thirds were successfully contacted. So the sample size ended up being you know, relatively small, but they did weight the um, analysis to try to represent uh, more, uh, excuse me, better represent the population before the hurricane. What they were able to find was African American and lower educated residents were less likely to return, perhaps no surprise, but what's important was they were less likely to return because of the places they lived in New Orleans before the storm. So it was the vulnerability prior to the storm that um, exacerbated the, less, the, like, the, the lower likelihood of their ability to return. So some really important differential vulnerabilities pre-storm which impacted um, a residents' abilities to return or not. Another example on natural resources, livelihoods, and migration in rural South Africa, this is my work. Um, I do work in the extreme northeast part of the country with my collaborators, Wayne Twine, uh, Mark Collins, and Baron Erasmus, and they're from the University of the Witwatersrand, which is based in Johannesburg. But we look at dependence on local communal landscapes among rural villages. And we have linked over the years demographic surveillance data with satellite imagery. So the University of Witwatersrand School of Public Health has a longstanding demographic surveillance site in this rural region of South Africa, where every year since the mid-1990s, they've collected household level information um, related to different demographic patterns, births, deaths, migration, and information on people such as age, sex, and education. But what they haven't studied is linking those people to place, as I mentioned a couple slides ago. So we took satellite imagery, merged it with the demographic data, and were able to statistically model the demographic patterns as related to local vegetation and change in local vegetation. And this is very important because in these villages, people depend greatly on the local community communal landscapes. We found that households with access to higher levels of nearby resources were actually more likely to move, which is in support of the environmental capital hypothesis, which argues that sometimes households that have more natural capital, more access to resources, can actually afford to engage in migration because migration is expensive. And that's, in fact, what we found there. The last quick example I'll give you is one from Bangladesh, migration floods and droughts in rural Bangladesh. And here, call, um, researchers Clark Gray from uh, Carolina and Valerie Mueller, who works at, the, at IFPRI, you see there, the International Food Policy Research Institute, we cleverly used some existing survey data from IFPRI, a long-standing chronic poverty and long-term impact survey. And when they fielded that survey, they didn't do that with the intention of studying environmental aspects of poverty. But in fact, the, the survey period spanned times of environmental challenges, including floods and rainfall scarcity, which resulted in crop failures. So this allowed the researchers to develop statistical models over a very long period of time that showed that crop failure actually reduced household level migration. So that's opposite of the South African research and supports the environmental scarcity hypothesis, suggesting that in times of environmental stress, households may be less likely to move. So you can see through these innovations, different kinds of findings are showing up in different settings which is how nuance is really being added to our understanding and we're moving away from that very simplistic climate refugee scenario. I forgot to mention that flooding didn't have an effect and that's interesting in and of itself in that in this area, seasonal flooding has been a regularity for a very long time and so households have coping strategies and don't necessarily permanently migrate. So let me quickly just move through these clusters of findings again. It's a little bit of a repeat of what Jason has presented, but I'll tag some um, particular studies onto these clusters. And so if you are interested in finding a particular research addressing a particular topic, that would be available to you. So environmental change can serve as a dramatic push. We've seen that in Hurricane Katrina. There's also some interesting research on the 2004 tsunami in Indonesia. 
Most environmental migrants voluntarily move short distances. We've seen that in Burkina Faso, and other research has found similar um, results in rural Nepal. Massey and colleagues did a study there in 2010. Environmental change can constrain some migrants, so that would be the environmental scarcity hypothesis. We've seen that in Burkina Faso and also in rural Guatemala, some work by Lopez Carr, who's at the University of California at Santa Barbara. And environmental factors interact with other migration drivers, going back to that idea of complexity. We've seen how political conditions and response to uh, different kinds of natural disasters can shape migration, evacuation, and return migration to places like um, the Gulf Coast in the U.S. after Hurricane Katrina, and work has also found that in Bangladesh. Work has also found, this is uh, some other work of mine, looking at migration from rural Mexico to the U.S., that social networks are very key, and that the way the environment shapes migration is often related to whether or not households have particular connections in their possible destination region. So a few studies there that uh, might be of interest to you if you want to further explore the complexity of the migration decision-making process. So this is the slide I showed earlier. Um, remember the micro characteristics, the meso characteristics, and the macro factors all shaping um, the decision. Two more points, and I'll hand it back to Jason. Um, there are a couple of innovative data sources that I uh, thought you might find of interest, and I wanted to make sure that you were aware of. One is called Terra Populous, which you can find through the University of Minnesota, a new collection of data that's integrating population and environment information from censuses, uh, satellite imagery, climate records, and so on. And the Center for, the Inter for International Earth Science Information Network, which is more affectionately called SEASON, you see the acronym there, works at this intersection. And they have an online um, repository. It's really a clearinghouse for all sorts of data that allow researchers to explore these human environment interactions. So I'll hand it over to Jason at this point to talk about policy. Thank you, Laurie. So I am just going to really ask the question, or try to answer the question, of what does this mean for policy? Uh, these studies make clear that environmental migration is real and uh, complicated, but deserves uh, more attention. Our current understanding of migration and environment relationships doesn't really help us answer this question, uh, can we estimate future migration due to environmental change? Uh, it doesn't help us to predict with any clarity on a global scale of how migration might respond to the future climate changes that uh, both Lori and I discussed. But I think from a policy perspective, this suggests that continued research on the connections between environmental change and migration uh, is critical. And Lori's pointed out some great studies uh, that are underway and continuing and some good sources of data, as well as methods for continuing to pursue this research. I think it's important to point out that uh, there are different ecosystems that are relatively understudied, such as coastal areas. Uh, and we've seen some research reported on in drylands, but uh, it's been difficult to gather research on places where resources are governed by common property rules, in which it's hard to link a household to their actual resources. Uh, so there are still some challenges for, uh, for us methodologically, and also just places where researchers haven't uh, really focused attention yet. So I would call, from a policy perspective, for, uh, for continued research and funding uh, to answer these questions. Uh, to understand these relationships so that we can better estimate uh, future migration due to environmental change. That said, that's the big question. There are, um, there are some smaller policy implications that I think uh, we can answer from uh, the current state of research on migration and the environment. 
Uh, one that is, is pretty clear is that because of the complexity of environmental migration and because of the many factors that usually combine together with environmental change to spur a move or a migration, the term refugee really fits poorly with what is known about environmental, uh, environmental migration. Uh, you may know that the international definition of refugee refers to persons who cross international borders due to fear of persecution or violence. And this is, uh, this is a bit counter to the, our understanding of, um, of environmental migration. So the idea of an environmental refugee, uh, if we were to use that term, then would suggest a move uh, that's forced or unwanted and was across a, an international boundary. And as Lori pointed out, most of these moves are uh, due to complex causes, multiple causes. Many of them are voluntary moves. And they don't, people don't generally cross international borders, or the majority of people moving um, because of environmental reasons um, or because of a combination of reasons, including environmental change, are not moving across borders that would fit this definition of refugee. So if we are to try to, through policy means, identify people who move because of an environmental push, we've got to find a new uh, set of policy tools and definitions by which we could identify and provide support to those people. That said, the wide range of types of environmental changes that influence migration, uh, as I mentioned earlier, from rapid onset environmental shocks, which we've seen, to slower onset environmental events, suggests that uh, very different policy and program responses are needed depending on the type of of environmental pressure. Natural disasters uh, might require immediate support for displaced persons and assistance in rebuilding homes and livelihoods, uh, providing immediate protection for those who uh, have been displaced. And in general, people who are most vulnerable will be those least able to rebuild and move quickly back to their homes and livelihoods. So a certain, in those cases, a certain type of um, aid and support, development support, will be needed. And compare that to slower onset environmental events uh, in which migration may represent, as Lori mentioned, an actual creative adaptive strategy for some of the poorest households. And uh, we know that adaptive strategies uh, to climate change are being actively supported now through uh, many new climate change initiatives. And research on migration and the environment suggests that these programs really should give some consideration to the role that migration is playing as an existing or potential adaptation strategy. So in this case, migration. Uh, may be a positive way in which households respond, and in some cases we may be, be trying to facilitate uh, more migration or facilitate the uh, remittances to households in origin areas or remittances or sending money back to households so that those households can um, will be resilient or um, able to adapt to, to the changing climate and uh, in some cases claim uh, changing uh, impact on their livelihoods or natural resource-based livelihoods. So there are a lot of different policies and programs that need to be thought about and thought about in the context of both the different environmental pressures and the different types of moves that are occurring. One promising policy development is that various governance uh, systems from international multilateral agencies uh, to bilateral donors and national governments are developing policies and programs that talk about enhancing the resilience of vulnerable households uh, to the common environmental changes that they face and the future environmental changes that they are likely to face. And this suggests that migration could fit into our larger concept of resilience and that 
if programs are thought about as being specific to the resilience of, um, of vulnerable households in particular contexts, we might be able to see these adaptable uh, policies that I called for earlier, or varying policies depending on the context. For example, I see here uh, USAID's uh, website on resilience, and resilience has become a bit of a buzzword here in Washington, but also some substance behind that. And we are st starting to see new programs, uh, such as this program uh, mentioned here, USAID RISE, and it's an initiative to build resilience in West Africa's Sahel, uh, an area which Lori mentioned in the, in the case of Burkina Faso has uh, been subject to periodic drought and uh, movement of people. And so in 2011, the US uh, uh, Agency for International De Development, USAID, uh, really through their resilience policy and program guidance is really making a commitment to better coordinate um, this type of development and humanitarian approach throughout their work. And this RISE program or project is uh, one of the more recent results of that. This project just launched in early 2014, commits more than $130 million over um, the first two years of a five-year effort uh, to build resilience to the recurrent crisis in West Africa's Sahel. And although it doesn't specifically focus on migration at this point, I think there's a real opportunity uh, for us to, as researchers and uh, as policy advocates to think about and encourage uh, programmers to determine how uh, future resilience initiatives treat environmental migration. I do also want to mention that uh, although we haven't talked about it today, uh, there's a huge amount of research that also talks about uh, migration and its impacts on the environment, not just migration as a response to environmental change. And we do talk uh, in more depth about this in the uh, in the population bulletin, but certainly there's a whole body of research which suggests that not only do we need to think about environmental change and its impact on migration, but also migration as a cause for environmental change. And this image of a of a classic fishbone pattern of deforestation in the Amazon of Brazil um, suggests that movement of people to new places also has uh, consequences for uh, various types, of uh, various ecosystems. And this image is actually in an area where uh, colleagues uh, from Indiana University and Brown have been doing quite a bit of research linking uh, migration, livelihoods, and environmental change. So that all complete. I hope that you will go to our website, prb.org, uh, for more information on migration and the environment. You can download this population bulletin from our website and find more uh, content on population environment connections. And I think at that at this point, I'll turn it over to our moderators to collect and ask questions of us. So thank you so much for your uh, participation. Great. Thank you, Jason and Lori. And at this point, we'd like to open it up for questions. And we have a number that have come in. So we may not be able to get through all of them, but we'll try to get through um, as many as we can here. So the first question is, um, why has most of the migration environment research so far been focused in less developed countries? Jason, should I take that one? Lori, as editor of the Population Environment Journal, I think you see more of it than I do, so why don't you go okay. ahead? Okay. <laughs> and I do, I do work in rural South Africa and rural Mexico. And I think my, um, my gut reaction to that would be that um, in many rural settings, of, uh, particularly impoverished rural settings of less developed cultural spaces, Households are more reliant on the local environment um, in a way that just doesn't characterize life in in the U.S., especially urban areas. 
right? So, so if we think about our environmental footprint and the way that we make use of environmental resources on a daily basis, it's so different in Boulder, Colorado or in Washington, D.C., where we're using resources that have come from all over the world. So if we think about environmental change having an impact on our daily lives, that impact is much more direct when somebody is collecting food for dinner from the communal landscape right outside their backyard, when they're solely dependent on rain-fed agriculture, or they're collecting wild grasses, or one of the images I showed I forgot to mention was of a woman making a, a beer out of a marula fruit, which is a, a indigenous fruit in rural South Africa um, that they collect and make this beer and then sell it from the front porch as a livelihood strategy. So if the marula trees go away because of climate change, certainly that's going to have real impacts on local livelihoods. And I, I think that's the reason is that connection to the very local um, makes this migration a much more likely possibility in the event of shifts in local environments. Okay, great. Thanks. And I just, uh, Linda, if I could just add a quick Absolutely. moment of data. You can go to our world population data sheet and see uh, the percent urban just released, uh, oh, I suppose just a few weeks ago. And the more developed world is 77% urban, whereas the least developed world is 28% urban. And that really characterizes, as Lori mentioned, the dependence on uh, natural resources. Okay, um, and there have been a couple of questions, so I'm just going to address this in, in case people have to leave before the end of the webinar. Um, as we said at the outset, this webinar is being recorded, so the recording, including the slides, will be available um, after the webinar is over, and if you registered for this webinar, which you must have if you're listening to this, um, then you will be sent a link to the recording. So that's an answer to a couple of you who've asked a question. Um, Here's another question. Um, could either of the speakers please address the question of family planning as a climate change adaptation strategy or as part of resiliency efforts? Yeah, uh, Lori, I think I'll take that question. I think that's, yeah, that's more you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, I'm not uh, sure exactly what the question is. I guess the question I'll 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 go ahead and ask a little further, which is uh, if if we're thinking about whether or not family planning is um, a, is part of adaptation strategies to climate change. Um, there are not a lot of studies uh, that have looked at whether or not family planning. Uh, could be or should be a uh, specific uh, strategy, but I think uh, my work here at, at through my work here at PRB, we've actually been convening an expert working group on uh, population family planning and climate compatible development to look more closely at that question of how does um, ensuring that people are able to have the uh, number of children and the timing and spacing of those children that they choose, how does that affect their uh, vulnerability to climate change and their ability to adapt? And uh, I think there's not a lot of research making those connections, but it's a, it, there are some very clear links between family planning and people's uh, women's education. And we know that education is critical to adaptive capacity as well as vulnerability. So there's some some clear links that haven't been connected yet, but I think we can comfortably make them. And we are asking through that expert working group um, how family planning um, through different policies could become a response um, that we support through development efforts focused on resilience and uh, climate change adaptation. Uh, I'll say that, that we'll have a report out soon, and I hope to do another webinar in which I can really share a lot more information on that connection. So stay tuned, and we'll we'll give you the punchline in another few weeks. Okay, our next question is: Does the research on migration and, and environment also consider the positive effect of changing climate that opens up new opportunities for international migrants? Uh, 
Wow. Not really. <laughs> this is Lori, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> That's a really interesting question. Um, so one thing, the first thing that comes to mind is that question um, requires thinking about um, environmental conditions as a whole. And the things that we've been talking about predominantly are about environmental conditions being a push. So to me, it sounds like the question, the, the, um, the question is about new opportunities, say new new areas where agriculture may be viable in the future that it isn't today, and therefore migrants moving to those areas. And um, I'm not familiar with any work along those lines. It's a really interesting idea. Um, there's work if we think about my um, excuse me if we think about the environment as being a pull factor in migration that work tends to uh, focus on amenities so things that um, that tend to be more aesthetic stuff like coastlines or um, beautiful mountainscapes or those kinds of and aspects of the environment that would pull migrants I certainly imagine you could consider a productive agricultural landscape and environmental amenity that would draw migrants. But that particular kind of research I have not seen yet. And I might add that a lot of the changes that are um, likely to be positive in terms of um, agricultural livelihoods are projected to happen in higher latitudes where not a lot of the currently vulnerable people live. So. Um, little bit of a disconnect between where positive impacts of climate change might happen from a from an agricultural livelihood perspective and where people actually are today uh, and so that's a I think a question that not many people have looked at yet okay our next question is what do you think we need the most for estimating future migration due to environmental change methodology data or modeling tools Are we allowed to say all of the above? <laughs> well, I think the, method, the methods are progressing. And I think that now people have identified the methods. Um, there's still a lack, a, a, lack of, uh, a lack of the studies and data that, to apply those methods to. And um, so that is, I think, one of the, co one of the constraints. I, I do know uh, many of my colleagues you know, kind of scouring the globe for these uh, data sets that, in which they can um, actually do this research. So we don't have these kind of long-term um, ongoing studies that have been done across large scales. Uh, you know, we see you know, a study in Bangladesh that where they were, they happened to be able to make the connections between the social and environmental data. But I think more often than not, it's happenstance or it's serendipity in which we're able to do this as opposed to uh, research studies that have been designed from the outset uh, to allow us to study these relationships. So uh, I would say the methods are getting there and the data are still um, are still the limit, large limitation. So I would add too, one of the challenges is that you know from the work that has been done, it's clear that this relationship unfolds in different ways in different places. So, you know, we've kind of got this ad hoc collection of case studies, as Jason has suggested, you know, where data has allowed people to ask these questions. So I, I do agree that we need, you know, it would be amazing to have a more systematic, some sort of global monitoring system that followed um, both social and natural um, phenomenon in particular places of the world where we thought you know, this migration environment connection was going to be particularly important. So if there were collection uh, systems in place that would allow uh, comparable comparative studies across spaces, that would be incredible, surveillance systems of sorts. But I would leave, I would not leave theory out of that list of things that are really important because, you know, you can collect data till the cows come home, but I think you also have to really think carefully about well, what data needs to be collected and how those data come together within the models and it's theory that guides that. So that framework that I showed, you know, thinking about um, 
the various pieces because otherwise, you know, elements can get missed and our answers can be wrong. So I'd put theory on that list of important things for understanding climate future. Okay, and I think we have time for just one more question here. Um, so to kind of pull this back to policy, the question is, have governments developed any specific migration policies to prevent or facilitate environmental migration? Well, I, the answer is that I'm not uh, aware of specific examples right now of uh, policy responses to environmental migration. Uh, the reality is that regardless of environmental change, migration policy, uh, as evidenced right here in the United States uh, and in other countries around the world, is a politically sensitive topic. Uh, it doesn't tend to respond to research and to data. And when you combine that with the equally sensitive topic of climate change, uh, one can imagine that political consensus uh, linking these two things, migration policy and climate policy, um, to really think of a policy on environment and migration um, is, is rare. And I'm not um, aware of any to date. And I really welcome from any of you out there who know of examples um, to share those with us. Um, you're welcome to reach out to us through email because I'm not aware of examples. And this and does then suggest that we've we've uh, probably not looking at migration policies per se that are going to be addressing this, but rather resilience policies and ad adaptation policies. Uh, and Jason, let me just interject that one of our participants, um, as opposed to a question, has actually just sent in a comment that in North China, the government has initiated a series of ecological migrations to move populations out of areas considered ecologically marginal. So I, I would invite this participant to uh, take Jason up on his offer to uh, communicate uh, by email to uh, continue that. Uh, conversation. Lori, did you have anything you wanted to add to um, sure. the question know, about I'm aware government? of a couple of uh, more local programs. They aren't policies, but I believe in Papua New Guinea where there's, um, you know, there's small, small um, island nation states that are just disappearing. And so there are national level, um, well, not national, regional level programs to try to help integrate island families into mainland communities. But as Jason said, that's tough stuff because folks aren't always welcomed with open arms, even within their own national borders. So mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say that's a policy, but I'm aware of some sort of efforts to integrate migrants into um, broader cultures. But that's, um, you know, that's also tough going. So yeah, I would love to hear more examples from anyone. Okay, great. Well, we are out of time. I want to thank our speakers once again, Jason Bremner and Lori Hunter, and all of our participants on today's webinar. We hope you'll be able to join us for future webinars on population and related topics. So this concludes today's presentation, and thanks again for participating.